I'm determined. That's why I was desperate. When you sent me that message going, serves me right for sticking my head out. I was like, no, <laughs> no, this is not how this is gonna go. Appreciate this that. This is not how this is, this is not how this should ever go. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest is a friend of the show and a restaurateur, James Cavarini. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me both. Listen, man, it's great to have you on. I wish the circumstances were different. We'll talk about that in a second. But before we get into that, tell everybody, who are you? How are you where you are? What has been your journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? Right. So uh, both my parents came over from Italy uh, to open restaurants in, in the UK. My father was part of the sort of first wave of Italian restaurants that opened up. Remember that we've only really had restaurants in this country for like 55, 60 years. My dad settled on a little place in Kensington High Street called La Portico, which opened in 1967, I believe. And then uh, started working his absolute butt off as hard as he could. Um, I, and then got married to my mum. My mum joined the business again. And, you know, fast forward 55, 56 years and here we are still going strong. And it's a, you know, it's a restaurant where we go to celebrate birthdays and occasions and, and all of that. It, it, you're great. The food's great. Everything's great. Um, but there have been some events recently, yeah. <laughs> haven't there? Yes. So basically the whole point about having a neighborhood restaurant is you have to be a central part of your neighborhood, I mm. believe. And that you want to plug yourself in as much as you can into the community. You want to be, if you want to be successful, you've got to be indispensable, right? So when in the good times and the bad times, for example. So during COVID, we made sure that everybody was taken care of in terms of dropping around food to elderly people and vulnerable people. And obviously when things happen around the world that your customers are interested in, you want to be part of that. You really want to plug yourself into that because it's very important. And it's a very emotional business. And you want to, you want to be there for your customers when they, when they need those kind of, those kind of events, right? And um, JK Rowling, who is a woman that I admire, greatly, not just for her hard work, but also for her courage as well. Um, it, basically with Suzanne Moore, an ex-Guardian uh, columnist, another woman who I admire, we decided to raise money for JK Rowling's charity in Ukraine called Lumos. Uh, lots of people got on board. Uh, we decided not to publicize the event prior because of the negative attraction that it might bring with it. And then after the event, um, Joanne JK was kind enough to basically put out a tweet thanking me for raising money for Lumos. We raised almost twenty thousand pounds, which mm, for one night's wow. dinner was just you know not bad. And all that money is going to go to help you know orphans in Ukraine and help kids where it's, you know who genuinely need that money. Um, unfortunately, because she has her views, which are entirely you know fair enough in in my opinion. People then jump on the bandwagon and I start getting, you know, one-star reviews on Google and, you know, don't go to this restaurant because this guy's a transphobe and this and the other. And then I go to work one day and find that the place has been, the windows at the front, which we had sort of tempered security glass has been smashed. Another pane of glass has been smashed. Somebody's got entry into the place and uh, ransacked stupid stuff, you know, like smashed up a bit, bottles of booze, that kind of stuff, and then left. Now it's really, now what's really important is that there is zero hard evidence connecting the physical attacks and the online stuff. Mm -hmm. The online stuff you know is coming from trans rights activists mm -hmm. because you you know because they say things like that I'm a homophobe, I'm a transphobe, and all this kind of stuff, which is absolute baloney. But the fact that it happened 24 hours after the first the first online attacks happened made me very very suspicious. How many times have your restaurant been smashed up in, in the in the 55 years it has been in existence? I mean, you're always going to get some sort of break-ins, but we haven't had any trouble for at least a decade. Right. And then wow. it happens 24 hours after this. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and what was that like turning up at your restaurant and just seeing the, the effect that it's had? The thing is that when the, the first thing you feel is just, just like, you know, you just like DEFCON five levels of anger. Mm. You know, you just think, well, why the hell do I have to deal with this kind of crap? Yeah. That's the first thing. And then you realize, well, you know what? Why shouldn't I have to deal with it? Everyone else in the world has to deal with this, with crap. Why should I be any different, right? Mm. So like, you know, it's a whole why me, why not me thing. Yeah. You know? Um, and then you start to realize, and then, I don't know, man. I mean, it's like, maybe it isn't connected. Maybe it is a coincidence. The truth is, I, you know, 
will I ever know? I don't know. I got another person, you got other people now online, you know, somebody now from Florida has got involved in telling that they're going to talk to the place. You know, so it's like, I don't need this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, apart from the fact that, you know, J.K. Rowling's views are J.K. Rowling's views, my views are your views, or my views are my views, and everybody has their own personal views. It's like, it wasn't a gender critical event. Mm. We weren't going around saying to people, we support, <laughs> you know, the we support, you know, the exclusion of trans people from, from women's only space. We weren't saying any of the sort. We were there exclusively to raise money and, uh, and to help, you know, a, a desperate situation in Ukraine, and that was it. I just can't believe that we're having this conversation, really. When did you start noticing that something was up? Was it the moment that the tweet came out and you started to then start to see responses? Or did it take a little bit of a while? Uh, it took a little bit of a while because I'm very careful about what I put out on social media. I mean, most people, you know, I think I think you have to be guarded, especially when you've got a public-facing restaurant. Mm. And also, I don't like to get involved in politics with my customers. And I, you shouldn't be... I, I honestly believe that if you're... A, if you've got a public business, uh, you should be there for the public. For, and, and it doesn't matter if people are left wing, right wing, trans rights activists, or gender critical. As far as I'm concerned, everybody's welcome in the restaurant because they're there to they're there to have. And by the time. way, that's always been my experience. Like we get on, but I don't know what your political views are because that's not what we talk about. Yeah, but why would you? Why would you bring that up over dinner? Right? You don't want to go and ruin somebody's decent dinner and go and talk about religion or politics. It's just like just leave them alone. Yeah. You know, they're there, they're there on a date night or they're there for whatever and, you know, and they're there to have a good time and you're there to facilitate that process. Unless and you don't want the date to go well. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, that, exactly. and so that's, that's literally it. So the idea that we kind of like, you know, put out this, take this political stance is absolute baloney. Right. But obviously you can't help have a bias by liking certain tweets. And I've liked certain tweets by Julie Bindle and Suzanne Moore, things that I, that I think are eminently sensible personally. Mm. And so people then link two and two together and, and come up with the wrong number and therefore start calling me a transphobe and a homophobe and all this kind of other stuff. Did you ever think that you'd be in that position where you put on an event yeah. which is not connected in any shape or form yeah. to, this, to this particular issue yeah. and then you just get sucked into this vortex where you become another talking point in the culture war? I think that at the end of the day, it's almost like it's like spin the bottle some days on Twitter, you know, who the outrage is going to get directed at, you know, and you guys have probably had it a lot more than I have. I mean, it's quite, I mean, I, but this is the Yeah, first. but James, see, sorry to interrupt. There's a, there's a difference, man. Like what we do is political by design, Yeah. right? If when we get shit on social media, we're like, well, that's fair enough. It's what we do. I mean, the show, <laughs> the show is called Trigonometry. Yeah. Like that's fine because we discuss controversial issues and some people aren't going to like that. Yeah. But you didn't do that. This is this is kind of why I really wanted to to speak with you about this because I just I am so angry about this on your behalf because look, I don't think it's legitimate for people to go and destroy your place whether that's online by writing yeah. fake reviews or physically. Yeah. Even if you did a gender critical event, but you didn't even do that. It's just this person who happens to have written some really, really popular books, who happens to have taken, by the way, a very nuanced and carefully worded position on the gender issue. And you did a fundraiser for something completely unrelated with her. Yeah. And now you're coming to your restaurant, which is a family restaurant. You've got kids there. You've got people there, right? Yeah. You've got staff there. And it's it's getting attacked because you you stood next to a person who said some things that some people don't like. Yeah, that's basically where we're at. That's right. exactly where we're at. And you messaged me afterwards going like, it's sort of something along the lines of serves me right for sticking my neck out. <laughs> you didn't even stick your neck out. <laughs> you didn't do anything. Yeah. There is that. You there didn't do that. anything. I know. I know. But the thing is that at the end of the day, people will say, well, it's guilt by association. Yeah. People, and this is just to play devil's advocate. People will say, well, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have had an event with J.K. Rowling because you knew. Well, she's not fucking Hitler, mate. <laughs> she's not Hitler. I, I mean, totally she's do. to some people, mate. But do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 I totally get it. Connor, I totally get it. I know, I know, it's bonkers. And the thing is that I don't really care about the break-in. I know. Because, and that's partly because I don't care about it for two reasons. One, because it's a pane of glass. If it was my house, I would have cared where my wife and my children sleep. Yeah. That would be different. But I've also got a big 55 kilo Mastiff at home, so she yeah. would have dealt with that. So I don't really care about the pane of glass. I don't really care about the answer thing because at the end of the day, it's only stuff. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I do care about the one-star reviews because that because as you know, having a digital business, it stays on there forever. 
you know, and somebody calling me a transphobe and I can report that to Google and I can say to Google, look, this is BS. You can see that this is BS. Please, yeah. can you take it down? Yeah. And then they see that that gets taken down. So then they start getting clever about it. And then they're like, the owner's really mean and the food's crap. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, come on, man. It's like, fair enough. I'm, you know, I'm not always Mr. Way of Sunshine. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, like leave the poor chef alone. He's been there 35 years. Yeah. And he knows how to cook a bowl of spaghetti. Yeah. Now. The fact that you've got these reviews, what kind of impact does it have on your business? It's huge. Especially now coming out to tourist season. Like you've had three years of the most torrid, possible time for hospitality, right? Mm. You've had lockdown, then unlockdown, then masking, then social distancing, then you can only serve outside and it's pissing down with rain. Mm. And do you know what I mean? As you've got all that crap to deal with, you're just coming out of that. We're now coming into a massive economic recession. Food costs are through the roof, staff costs are through the roof, your customers feeling the pinch as well. So the absolute last thing you need now is you know, a shit, cl a shit cloud of basically problems. Mm. So it's just bringing more stuff to the fore, which you just don't need. And at the end of the day, um, you know, like I said, your digital, it's like your digital shop fund. Most people will check out a restaurant on Google before they decide to walk through the door. Yeah. Most people will read an Amazon review before trying to buy a product now. So whether you like it or not, you have that digital shop fund. And it's literally the equivalent of somebody like, you know, painting on your shop sign, do not bother eating here. This place will give you Listeria or something, you know, that's what the that's what the equivalent is. So you will lose and you will never be able to measure how much business you'll lose because of it. Mm. Because you don't know how many people will look on that and see those one star reviews and think, well, you know, they're not going to know the nuance. Yeah. A lot of them won't even realize what's happened. They'll no. just see one lots of one stars and go, yeah. Oh, this restaurant's gone downhill. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the way that the way that we're set up as well. You know, from an evolutionary perspective as well, the fact that you know, a once you need about twenty five or thirty five star reviews to counter back to counteract every bad one star review mm -hmm. because a negative comment holds so much more sway than yeah. a positive yeah. comment. You always remember the things you did badly. You never remember the things you did well. Yeah. That's just human nature. That's with all of us, you know. So a one star review is like there's like, I'll just stick a five star review above it. It's like it's not that simple. It's not like for like. Yeah. Mm. You know, I think Andre Agassi said that when he, you know, he said, you know, the thrill you feel when you win a tournament is nothing compared to the dejection you feel when you lose. You know, and and that thrill goes like that, but the dejection stays with you forever. And it's the same with online reviews. You know, that that one star thing is really massively, massively damaging, and people don't realise because they just think, oh, it's just a bit of fun. I'll just take one one star. Apart from the idiot who said he was going to burn down my restaurant. I'd quite like to meet in person. <laughs> <laughs> With the master fit yeah, right there. But but we're joking about it. Mm. But as somebody who has received death threats, we both have, mm. even there's a logical side of your brain which is going, look, this person is X, Y, and Z. Mm. But there's still a little bit of you that goes, well, hang on a second. Yeah. I don't know this person. Yeah. I, I don't agree. know what they're capable of. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It's the it's like the, the theory of the drunken driver always has the right of way. Yeah. Like if a guy's careering down the road on the opposite side of the road going straight for you, you're not going to say, well, I'm in the right, so I'm just going to stay where I am. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just get the hell out of the way. Yeah. Hey, Francis, have you decided what to get your dad for Father's Day? Same thing as always. A couple of pints down the dog and duck, plus a new Brexit means Brexit car sticker to replace the one I got him last year. Mate, Brexit was in 2016. Do you not think he might want something a bit more up to date? Like a new Ridge wallet. This is mine. It's smooth, sleek, stylish, and it can hold 12 cards. And there's also a clip on the back for cash as well. It's not going to create a bulge in your trousers like those bulky old wallets. It'll make your dad look like a top level player. Great idea. He can also put his Brexit sticker on it, which means the problematic older ladies are gonna love him. Yeah, okay. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have just one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge is so confident in their product, they'll give you 45 days to test drive their wallet. That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it in 45 days. Unlike Brexit. Mm. Because Ridge is such great guys, they're gonna give you 15% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. That's 15% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special promo code, which is of course, trigger.
This is why I'm so angry, James, because, you know, you, you are a fighter and you've always have been and mm -hmm. your restaurant has gone up and down and, and, and you've always worked extremely hard. And, and that's actually what we usually talk about, the importance of working hard and, and being courageous in the face of difficulty. And I really admire that about you even, and in this situation too. But I'm angry about it on your behalf because what this is, is intimidation and bullying. Yeah, 100%. Mm. And it's trying to stop people from even going near a person mm. who happens to have an opinion that some people don't like. Yeah, yeah. But they don't even know my opinion. I know, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I'm like one step removed from the opinion. I just happen to own a bricks and mortar site where somebody with an opinion raised money for charity. Well, actually, I raised money for charity with yeah. her and with Suzanne Moore. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's like the whole guilt by association thing is just absolute lunacy. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I think it's interesting because you, you know, you look at the profiles for people who do criticize you on, on Twitter, you know, and you look at the profiles of people who are, you know, writing these one star reviews. And there is, you know, a sort of correlation of, you know, the more deranged the comments are, the number of flags and the number of little emojis they have <laughs> after their name, right? So you think, okay, fair enough, maybe, maybe these people, maybe it's just, Maybe they're just having a tough time in life, sure. whatever. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they're incredibly resentful. I don't know what's going on with their lives, so who am I to judge? But leave me the hell alone, man. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like, take out your anger on, some, on something that's yeah. worth fighting for. Yeah. Yeah. This is not worth fighting for. Me having, uh, re, you know, helping to raise money for orphan kids in Ukraine is not the right target here, you know? And I think a lot of people, I think they're just confused. They don't even know where they are now. They don't even know what the target is because I think that, things change so quickly now on social media that it just seems to be this kind of endless, you know, barrage of abuse. Like I said, it's almost like a game of spin the bottle. It's like, well, the bottle's spinning over there, so let's all just direct our bile and our hate over this direction. Mm. And I think a lot of it is just misguided nonsense. They just don't understand, almost in one sense. You know, and I think it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a bit like veganism in one sense. You know? He wants he <laughs> wants more people to hate him. <laughs> no, but I mean, in the sense that, the sense that I, have, I have vegan friends and, you know, but... That, in, that, that is the worst excuse. I'm yeah, a racist, I do, mate. I do. I've got a black friend. He <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> said Labradors don't count. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's true that I've got vegan customers. I do generally have vegan friends, but it's interesting that with when it comes to their specific reasons for being vegan, a lot of it, they don't see... A lot of it is, comes from a very almost myopic view of the food chain, a very myopic view of how they want to how that how they want to interact with the food chain, and I think it's sort of similar with people who view of their role in society. How so do you mean? To talk to us more about the vegan thing. Well, it's like you know, so it's like most people who live in the countryside, most people who see how you know how the sort of natural world op operates, you know, aren't vegan. It seems to be an extremely urban thing. It seems to be a very young urban thing, like ninety. Three or ninety-one percent of vegans are aged between twenty and thirty, or between twenty and thirty-five. Because they die after that. <laughs> <laughs> most of them don't have kids. Right. Most of them live alone, and most of them live in urban areas. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So they have this very kind of like filtered view, right? And it's a bit like what you know our mutual friend Rob Henderson would say about luxury beliefs. They have this belief that they think enables them to consider themselves a better person because of because of animal welfare and all that kind of stuff. But what they don't realise is the knock-on effect that it has later on down, you know, further on down the social chain towards maybe those in a kind of more service economy or those in a more rural economy and that kind of stuff, right? So, for example, they don't think about the effect of maybe the woman who has to harvest their quinoa in Bolivia who can no longer afford the stable crop because the price has shot through the roof because somebody in Islington is prepared to pay 10 times the value for it. Or they don't think about maybe the uh, the deforestation for soy to make their you know their soy milk. Or they don't maybe think about the fact that there are whole villages in Central America now that don't have any clean portable water because it's all being diverted off avocado plantations because everybody wants avocados and toast, and they don't make that connection. For them, it's just like plant based equals good, meat equals bad, and that's the world that I'm going to want to live in, right? And it's very similar, I think, with, you know, I, you, I think there are a lot of these beliefs. I think there are a lot of these things that they don't, they just don't see how it can hurt other people. And that's not to say that they're bad people for having their beliefs. Mm. You know, I don't believe that vegans are terrible people for, the, you know, Christ, for the love of God. I just think that they have their view. But I think if they actually went out and actually had a look at 
the reality of the food chain and the reality of what it takes to actually bring food from a field into your plate, maybe they would look at things a little bit differently. You see what I mean? I and, I th- and I think that's the same with a lot of trans rights activists. I think it's the same with a lot of people who have a lot of these, you know, these beliefs, you know, and, you know, they just, they just, you know, we all live in a bubble really. But I think in an urban environment, I think that tends to be a lot more so, you know. It's also about certainty, isn't it? Because mm. if your narrative is incredibly simple, then mm. you can be very certain about it. Yeah. This is, it's a black and white issue. Yeah. This is completely wrong. Yeah. I am outraged. Yeah. Something needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. But if the if a, if a issue is complicated and requires thought and it's got nuance and actually you kind of see both sides of the particular issue, it's very difficult to be outraged about it. Yeah. And to generate traction. Because you have to put yourself in the other person's position. Yeah. You have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to put yourself in the position of the person that you're arguing against in order to see it from their side. Mm -hmm. And most people don't want to do that because it gives them a sense of... Because then in a way it takes away your immediate righteousness. And it takes away the immediate... The the, the feeling that you must be... It's the right side of history claim. Mm -hmm. And then you takes away your crutch of saying, well, I can do whatever I want because I know that fundamentally I'm going to be vindicated in the end because people will look back on this and see that I was right. And you think, mm, are you sure about that? Yeah, it, the thing that I find so discomforting about the idea of the right side of history is it comes down to certainty. Yeah. How do you know that you are on, inverted commas, the right side of history? Yeah. You must either be incredibly intelligent and have powers where you can look into the future mm-hmm. or you're actually very arrogant. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, these people who claim to be on the right side of history, what, you go and smash a local family-owned business's windows and you are on the right side of history by doing that. Mm. Well, yeah. Mm. No, yeah, you, I mean, see, it's, it's, I just would, I would yeah. caveat that by saying that there is still... We don't know, no, we, we we don't don't know. know for sure. Yeah. We don't know for sure. We right. don't know for sure, yeah. You but, smash it virtually with one-star reviews, yeah. which are yeah, more yeah, damaging. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, more damaging, yeah. Or, yeah. or you spend three days basically on Twitter saying that I did it myself <laughs> by saying that the glass broke the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> said with, with, like, somebody with a forensic signal. You, you know what really worries me about all of this as well? Because before you came in, I was saying to the boys here at the studio, I was going, do you think... We talk about trans so much now. And the thing that gets lost in the conversation for me is we've had a bunch of trans people on the show Mm. who identify or dress as or behave as or whatever words you want to put to it as the opposite sex to the one that they were born. And we're perfectly happy to treat them as they present. But why wouldn't you be? To respect them for what they are. And my problem with all of this is how is this helping trans people? How is any of this helping trans people? This isn't about trans people. This is about some people wanting to have some kind of righteousness. And and I went and I did and I... You haven't helped trans people. What's happening now, man, is the research is showing now acceptance of LGBT people is going down. It's yeah. going down yeah. because of shit like this. Yeah. You're not helping yeah. trans people, these people. Yeah. I mean... Uh- there was my very good friend Hadley Freeman said this really, really brilliantly. She was like, Look, I get the whole fact that each generation wants to have their cause. Mm. You know, our parents had their cause, you know, for gay rights or before that was civil liberties and then gay rights and everything. And, and you get to a point, and you know, and even Douglas Murray argues this, you get to a point where it's like, well, for an organization like Stonewall, for example, you know, set up by my friend Simon Fanshaw, who was at the event as well, you get to a point where you're like, okay, great. So we're now on equal harming in terms of the law. So, you know, gay couples can then get married, they can adopt children just the same way that, that, that heterosexual couples are. So it's like, so what else are we going to fight for now? You know, and, and as Hadley would argue, and I think she's right in the sense that, you know, it's, it's also a great way of telling off your parents if you're a kid. If you're a 16-year-old kid, what's the thing that you really want to do? You want to tell off your dad and you want to call him a bigot because <laughs> you've got that whole testosterone surging through your system and you want, to, you, want to, you want to break out this old dad, you don't know what it's like, this is the 2022, blah, 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 blah. You know, we've all done that. We've all been there. So it's like, so what's, what's the cause, right? What's the cause? It's like, yeah, okay, fair enough, fight for the planet. Great. You know, uh, fight for, I guess, animal rights, I guess, if you want, it ties in with a vegan thing. And then, you know, you, you know, you can't really fight for gay rights anymore, you can't really fight for civil rights anymore, because legally in the UK, at least, thank God, we're at the point now where we don't have to worry about that anymore, for the most part. So then you're like, well, how else can we do it? You know? And I think 
I think it is, I think a lot of it is that. And I think that's why a lot of people, I think, they get to a certain point in their life, especially maybe when they hit middle age, and they kind of start to understand more the sort of nuance of history. And then they maybe they come out of it, maybe they don't. I mean, we'll have to wait and see what happens now. But it is worrying that something happens online and it's now filtering into the real world. Because before we would have said, like, look, maybe three or four years ago, we would have said, oh, these are just a few idiots on Twitter. Mm. But then it's having real world impact on your business with the Google reviews. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. And again, going back to the luxury beliefs things, you don't realise that I employ 27 people. So we've got 27 people. If my business goes down, like any small business, like any labour-dependent business, when your income starts coming through the door, it starts dwindling, the first thing you're going to have to do is make layoffs. Because like 45 to 50% of all your income gets spent on staff. Absolutely. Right? So they don't think about the poor guy who has to get laid off because of the one-star reviews. They don't think about that kind of stuff. They just don't make that connection. They just think, you know, this guy associated with J.K. Rowling, he deserves, you know, a one-star review in Google for it. That's the end of the story. And it's like, well, really, come into the restaurant. Let me introduce you to the guys who work here. Let me show you what they're doing. Let me show you the way that they're turning their arms around. Mm. Let me show you how they're looking after their family and how they're putting food on the table for their mm. kids. You know? And the thing is about the restaurant business, as a general rule, is that anyone who's read Down and Out in Paris and London or Kitchen Confidential mm -hmm. or has worked in restaurants understands that it's a bit of a pirate ship you're working with guys who don't fit the mold of quote-unquote polite society. It's like comedy. It's like comedy, right? You, you're dealing with guys that aren't quote-unquote employable in an office in a nine-to-five Monday to Friday. And there are more people like that in society than most folks realise. They just don't see them. Yes. They don't see them because they're delivering their delivery on a Friday night, they're cooking their dinner, they're washing their dishes on a Saturday night in the local restaurants, and they're doing all this stuff, this kind of whole hidden economy of workforce, you know? And the thing is that we've always had a really amazing agreement in this country since the days of the empire, which was, you come and do the jobs that we don't want to do, yeah. <laughs> basically, mm. and we'll leave you in peace. And, you know, we all, all of us come from immigrant families in this room, right? Mm. And we all benefited from that. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, I know what my family did. You know, my dad came here as a 17-year-old or 18-year-old death illiterate immigrant and worked down the mines in Cumbria, in Whitehaven, six miles down, digging out iron ore underneath the North Sea, and then eventually set himself up in business. There was, like, he could not have done that if, the, if, if Britain hadn't been welcoming towards that. Mm. But the agreement was that he had to do the jobs that they didn't want to do. And it works. And as so long as that's open and that's fair, then everybody realizes that. The thing is that when those businesses that rely on the service economy, like restaurants, when they start to falter, you know, and one-star reviews will make them falter, what happens to those people? Where are they going to go? Because if they don't have stable jobs, and if they're not working 55, 60 hours a week, put food on the table and sending money back home and raising the standard of living everywhere that their money goes, what's going to happen? Do they go on benefits? Because that's pretty much... You know, because if, if, you know, or they just get a job somewhere else or, do you know what I mean? It's like, you've got to think about this kind of stuff. And we, we employ guys who are ex-prisoners. One of our best guys spent seven years in Brixton. He's come out, he's, you know, he's got a steady girlfriend. He's got one kid, he's got another kid on the way. And he's really doing well. But he needs work. He needs discipline. He needs to be steady work because otherwise he can't do it. I've got guys who come over from you know, from every country imaginable to send money back home, mostly at the moment, Romania, and they send money back home and they raise the standard of living in Romania. And the best way to do that is just to allow immigration because they can earn five, six, seven, eight, ten times more what they can in Romania than they can do in London just by doing the jobs that no one else wants to do. Pot wash, salad wash, food prep, all that kind of stuff. Right? And it's easy to sneer at these people and it's easy to say all that kind of stuff doesn't matter until you get to a point that we're at now where that labour force gets turned off because of if you're a Remainer, you blame Brexit, and if you're a Brexiteer, you blame COVID and furlough. The reality is we're never going to know. We don't have a pipeline in place to replace that labour force, right? Mm. So that gets shut down, that gets turned off, and then all of a sudden people start getting their holidays cancelled and they go, well, I can't, I can't go on holiday to, to Tuscany in half term because EasyJet's cancelled my flights. And it's only then that they realise 
It's like, dude, who do you think's been humping your baggage around the airports for the last, you know, for the last seven years? And it's only now that they're starting to make that connection. Do you know what I mean? So anything I can do to raise that awareness to say, look, guys, any opinion that you have about all this stuff and anything that any kind of, um, uh, uh, what was I going to say, any kind of um, footprint that you leave online, especially for businesses, matters. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it all boils down to employment and it all boils down to people putting foods on their tables for their kids. Mm. But it's like you said, they didn't think about that. They, they clicked don't. the one star. Yeah, they, they left a, you know, a, you know a, a crappy comment. They don't. They don't and care. They're on the right side of history yeah. and they go about their day and they've probably forgotten about it. Yeah. Now. And, then they, they, and they probably, and if they do it to me, they'll put, and they probably spent all day in front of that computer, sat there in their underpants, going one star, one star, one star, one star. And it's like, what can you do with these people? At the end of the day, it's like, how can you convince them to become stand-up members of society and go out there and stop being somebody who just breaks stuff yeah. all day? That's the thing, James, because destroying things is always easier than building yeah. them. You know Easy. that. You've built a business. That's what we're doing here. And that's why, you know, I've always admired you as a person because of your attitude. But also, people should know Il Portico is a great restaurant. The food is incredible. Like, my wife is always banging on, when are we going back? When are we going back? When are we going back? <laughs> Uh, it's the place we go to celebrate the birthdays, the big events, the the good months that we have here. Uh, and you're a great host. The people are wonderful. The food's amazing. So I know that our audience will really resonate with what you've said here. And I know that you'll see a lot of them coming through the door, supporting the business. And it's not supporting the business. It's enjoying great food and a great place. So yeah. uh, I'll encourage all of them to, to go out and check it out. And we'll be coming back very, very soon, James. Thank very, you. very soon. Um, you know what? We've always got one more question and I have a feeling you're going to have a very interesting answer to it, the one that we always ask at the end. Which is, what's the one thing we're not talking about but we really should be? I would honestly say, what's the biggest knock-on effect of your opinion? Anybody's opinion. What's that knock-on effect look like? You know? What's the knock-on effect of your your whole life philosophy that everybody wants to pin their lives around now? That's what I would say. James, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for All the me. best to pleasure. you. Look, I always believe that, you know, when we started the show, we were just two idiot comedians who wanted to, you know, find out why the world seemingly was going mental around us. But now I feel that so much of this, this cancel stuff and destroying people's lives over things they've said or who they stood next to or who they raised money with or, or whatever... Um, the only way that ends is if people who are victims of that are rewarded for making a stand. Yeah. And I know that that's going to happen here with you. Yeah, yeah. It has, and the outpouring of love has been amazing. It and really I want has more been of amazing. that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, there yeah, are a lot of people who are going to watch this and I know that all of them, there will be people among that who will contribute to that. So I'm determined. That's why I was desperate. When you sent me that message going... Serves me right for sticking my head out. I was like, no, no, this is not how this is going to go. Appreciate that. This is not how this is. This is not how this should ever go. And you're not the sort of person that's seeking out attention or trying to put yourself in a position to be cancelled so you can profit from it. You're just a good guy who happened to raise some money, and this has happened. And I'm determined that you benefit. You do better out of this, and I'm sure that you will. Thank so you. thanks for coming on, man. I'm sure our audience will, will be supportive of you. Thank you for uh, having me. And thanks for your time. And, and actually some very interesting thoughts. We'd love to have you back sometime to talk about the restaurant business. About Anytime. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. If you've enjoyed this show, episodes always go out Wednesdays and Sundays, 7 p.m. UK time. Raw shows are always 7 p.m. UK time, same time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon.